Good morning. So as we uh, sometimes remark, the uh, in the world of surgery, name lectureships are a big deal, and none in this department uh, bigger than the Samuel Gross lectureship, uh, which is a singular honor in the Department of Surgery, where, where we invite uh, some of the world's leading authorities, science and surgery, to take part in your education for a couple of days. And uh, it's really a pleasure uh, this year to uh, invite some, some friends and colleagues uh, in honor of Dr. Gross. Uh, Samuel Gross, for those of you who don't know or don't remember, is the father of American surgery. He is uh, largely credited with being the, the true father of American surgery and that the American surgical, the highest honors are, uh, are in his name as well. But Dr. Gross got his start, actually his second job, he spent a year in Cincinnati, but his, his first real job was chair of surgery at the University of Louisville, uh, starting in the 1840s. He spent his happiest 15 years here. If you read his rather tedious two-volume autobiography that I don't recommend that you do. And then he went on to found the famous Gross Clinic at Thomas Jefferson University. And you've all seen this famous painting. Uh, it's a masterpiece of Thomas Aiken's uh, painting of, of uh, Dr. Gross with the bloody scalpel, uh, masterpiece of 19th century American art, but uh, Dr. Gross was truly an amazing uh, individual, prolific uh, author and scientist. He got in trouble uh, in his laboratory. He did surgical research, which was rare at that time. He did research on intestinal suturing using dogs, and the dog lab was in the basement of the hospital, and they got fleas into the patient rooms. It caused a little bit of a stir. He had a little conflict with, with the administration at that time. But um, uh, Dr. Gross went on to fame and fortune and uh, in his honor, we have this lecture each year. So this year we have Dr. Steve Leach and uh, Kathy Kirkland. Um, and I will uh, begin my comments by uh, announcing that just prior to this uh, lectureship, they formalized their academic partnership by getting married during a trip to Tuscany. So congratulations. Uh, uh, Dr. Leach is a graduate of Princeton University uh, and went to Emory Medical School prior to uh, his uh, uh, residency at Yale and then his fellowship at MD Anderson Cancer Center, which is where I met him. And Steve was one of those young guns of uh, in the in the world of surgical oncology he was taking the world by storm doing all kinds of great research and, and uh, a fantastic surgeon who was a role model for the junior fellows and i was one of those who all wanted to be like steve leach uh he uh, started his career at vanderbilt where he spent about five years on the faculty he rapidly rose through the academic ranks and was recruited to run perhaps the world's most prestigious pancreatic cancer research program at Johns Hopkins University, where he spent 17 years, uh, again, tremendously successful, uh, and then uh, was recruited to Memorial Sloan Kettering, and then in 2017 to Dartmouth to become the Cancer Center Director at Dartmouth. And during the course of this time, Dr. Leach has become one of the nation's very top surgeon scientists, incredible record of NIH and other uh, funding uh, but more, even more impressively is the publications that he's had. Uh, he doesn't publish in, uh, in some of the journals that, that, that we, that I publish in. His papers are all in Nature Science, Cell, PNAS, and, and other top journals, an incredible example of, uh, of high-level team science. Uh, so Dr. Leach is really uh, uh, a great example of a uh, surgeon uh, making a, a huge difference in, um, in, in surgical research and, and running top flight research program. A uh, great role model for many of you, and I hope you take advantage of his expertise while you're here. And uh, Dr. Kirkland uh, is, uh, both of them are Southern natives, by the way, and now they're, they're up, up north, but Dr. 
Uh, Kirkland is a graduate of Mount Holyoke College and attended Dartmouth Medical School uh, before she went off to her residency in internal medicine at Columbia and then fellowship in infectious diseases at Duke. She spent a couple years also in fellowship at the CDC and then returned to Dartmouth to launch a very successful career in internal medicine and infectious disease where she took on a number of leadership roles at Dartmouth and then uh, about a decade ago changed her focus and did a fellowship in palliative care and now she directs their palliative care program uh, as a professor in the Department of Medicine at, uh, at Dartmouth and has had an astounding academic career in her own right. So her talk uh, will be a little bit different focus in the second hour, and then we'll have a resident conference with some case presentations for both of them to uh, be able to help with their education. So I'm incredibly uh, happy to, to uh, introduce Dr. Leach and Dr. Kirkland and uh, thank them for, for coming to the University of Louisville. Thank you so much, uh, Kelly. Um, I can't I can't express um, just how honored I am to give um, the gross uh, lecture here with with Kathy. Um, the Department of Surgery here at Louisville is um, one of our world class, you know, most historic, um, most productive, um, and uh, most generous departments of surgery. Uh, people. Uh, from my era have um, who graduated from this program have gone on to become leaders in in surgery and I remember when I interviewed for internship here uh, way back in something like 1986 and already uh, then it was very clear that this was the place where surgical leaders uh, came from and um, it's a real honor to be to be back here. Um, when I look at the list of prior gross lecture uh, lecturees, it's really um, uh, humbling. I'm also really um, honored to be here. Let me see how to advance this. Um, let's see. Hmm? Yeah, no, not the arrow keys. There we go. I'm also so honored to be here because it involves two very, very special people in my life. And one is, is Kathy, the Byrne professor at Dartmouth, um, who, as you'll see, is uh, both locally and nationally a thought leader in the medical humanities. And um, this is, I kind of consider coming to Louisville an extension of our honeymoon. So it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with Kathy and then uh, to be here uh, with, with Kelly. Kelly and I were fellows together, as he said, in uh, 1994, perhaps uh, we met, uh, and Kelly and 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 Beth and um, and my family, you know, all had young young boys together, as it tur turned out, and uh, just have a special uh, bond that I'll always cherish. And to see, you know, Kelly take over from from Dr. Polk and continue uh, the legacy here, it's it's really re re remarkable. So it's a true true honor uh, to be here uh, to give the 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 gross lecture. Um, let's see, I forgot how I did it. Um, no, escape and there we go. So this is Hanover, New Hampshire, where Kathy and I uh, live. And it's a place that um, is a little different from Louisville, but uh, also I think has some of the kind of rural country charm that many people enjoy living here in Kentucky. Uh, this is uh, the Dartmouth Green. This is Dartmouth uh, College. Um, and then way up on the hill here, just two miles away, is uh, uh, the Dartmouth Hitchcock uh, Medical uh, Center. Unusual site for a medical center up in the woods, uh, but a wonderful place to live and work. The, the mountains of New Hampshire here, the mountains of Vermont here. Kathy and I uh, live uh, right about um, right about here. And um, the, um, the talk I'm going to give today is a scientific talk, but I really want to make it relevant uh, to, to surgeons, and especially uh, surgical trainees. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, how we might think about uh, treating pancreatic cancer, but also how we might think about launching careers in academic surgery. And it's been so impressive for me to come back to the department of here, to, to the department here at Louisville and see how uh, academic training still looms larger here than in most 
departments of surgery around uh, the country. And that's obviously a testimony to, to the leadership. Um, but to think about um, how we may need to change our thinking a little bit um, as uh, surgeons if we want to succeed uh, academically. So I'm going to talk about rewiring the epigenomes of pancreatic cancer cells and uh, surgeon uh, scientists. And so I got interested in pancreatic cancer for the reason that, uh, that Kelly and, and uh, many, many others uh, are interested in it because of the incredible uh, technical challenges and the window to just um, miraculous anatomy um, and the opportunity to help uh, uh, patients and uh, uh, clearly spent the early uh, decades of my career uh, doing a lot of pancreatic cancer uh, surgery. It gradually occurred to me though that as much as um, I helped uh, patients uh, live a few extra years, often in the prime of life when they uh, got to walk their children down the aisle or meet their grandchildren, that almost all my patients uh, were still dying from this disease. And uh, as surgeons, we have a kind of narrow window, a narrow view of uh, the, 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 the global uh, uh, pancreatic cancer patient population, only about 15 to 20 percent of patients with pancreatic cancer ever come to surgery. The vast majority of them present with locally unresectable or disseminated disease and, um, and, and really uh, only have the option for extended survival with systemic therapy. And we kind of, I'm involved with the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network and in kind of a way that's a little bit uh, tragic, uh, if you will, we, we had a big celebration when the overall five-year survival for pancreatic cancer crossed double digits recently from longstanding single digits now up uh, to 12%. So we're doing, doing better, but we clearly um, have a long, long um, way to, to go. Um, and one of the reasons why patients with pancreatic cancer don't do so well is like unlike many other malignancies where personalized oncology uh, that is treating patients according to the molecular profile of their tumor um, have benefited patients with lots of different tumor types, certainly lung cancer, melanoma, colon cancer. Um, in pancreas cancer, we still treat all the patients the same way. We uh, uh, treat them with one of two dominant chemotherapy uh, regimens, e either um, um, abraxane and um, uh, paclitaxel and gemcitabine, or this five-drug regimen of fulfirinox. And this really provides benefit for some patients, but really marginal benefit for patients overall, with changes in median survival from just two to three months. And this is what happens when you treat uh, patients without the benefit of biomarker-selected therapy. And I want to talk to you about how we might move away from this situation today to one of uh, treating uh, individual patients with individual therapeutic regimens uh, based on uh, molecular biomarkers. And uh, when I was uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I led an effort where we sequenced the tumor genomes of 1,000 patients with, with pancre pancreatic cancer uh, most of whom had a uh, classic pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And what we found is that uh, uh, the patients um, had commonly had four major mutations that we think of as the four horsemen, if you will, of pancreatic cancer. They had, most of them had uh, mutations in the KRAS oncogene, um, in the tumor suppressor gene P53, in SMAD4 and this gene CDKN2A. But after that, it was a literal smorgasbord, just a smear of multiple, multiple, multiple uh, different uh, mutations and looked at a different way with pancreatic cancer over here on uh, the right. You can see all of the different mutation types in pancreatic cancer. And unlike uh, breast cancer, where we have uh, HER2, um, uh, positive disease, unlike uh, EGFR uh, mutant lung cancer, un unlike BRAF mutated melanoma, and certainly unlike CKIT mutated GI stromal tumors, there's no dominant molecular subgroup in which we can target a, 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 an effective molecular therapy. And when you have so many different um, mutational profiles, in a, patient, in a population of patients with cancer, it's very hard to, to design a clinical trial and have enough patients to accrue. So this is one of the big reasons why until very recently, 
Um, we didn't even have um, uh, uh, Medicare approval for sequencing the genomes of pancreatic cancer patients because there was no targeted therapy um, that we might um, um, use based on that sequencing. And that all changed um, uh, recently though, when uh, here's the, the distribution of all these single digit mutations in different uh, genes in pancreatic cancer. There's one exception to this, and this is this DNA damage repair group of genes, including uh, the breast cancer genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2. And we know that patients with ovarian um, uh, cancer with these mutations are exquisitely sensitive to various forms of therapy, including platinum-based chemotherapy and drugs in the class of PARP inhibitors. And so this raised the possibility that uh, when we add up all these all these uh, mutations together, as many as 10% of patients might uh, have mutations that sensitize them to these drugs. And sure enough, that proved to be the case. So this is a trial that was run by my colleague Eileen O'Reilly at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, where she took patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer and treated them with gemcitabine with cisplatinum and a PARP inhibitor, viliparib, in metastatic breast cancer. And the patients uh, in orange uh, are patients who don't have uh, mutations in breast cancer uh, genes. The patients in blue are patients who do. And this is a so-called waterfall plot where from baseline tumor volume, you can see the reductions or lack of reductions in uh, tumor diameter uh, in, uh, uh, in association with therapy. And you see none of the patients without uh, mutations in the BRCA genes had meaningful responses where um, patients with mutations in the breast cancer genes, um, some of them had complete clinical responses. Some of them with metastatic pancreatic cancer um, were had stable disease for up to three years. And this was really revolutionary uh, for uh, patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer who usually have survivals measured um, in the six month uh, range. And so um, from this baseline of non-biomarker driven therapy, uh, this was the first um, uh, evidence of the, a shift from non-biomarker driven therapy to biomarker driven therapy in, in this disease with um, gem abraxane and a PARP inhibitor. Um, and, and patients with pancreatic cancer are actually now completing chemotherapy who have these mutations and they're going on oral maintenance therapy with PARP inhibitors. And just the thought of something like maintenance therapy in pancreatic cancer uh, and patients with metastatic disease, not all obviously, but many are now leading active uh, lives uh, based on this biomarker driven therapy. So the question is what other biomarker driven therapies uh, can we uh, develop? And so I'm gonna tell you a story that's really come to uh, 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 clinical productivity recently. It's a story led by an unbelievably talented surgical oncologist, Vinod Balachandran, who worked as a postdoctoral research fellow in my lab at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And, and Vinod was puzzled by the fact that patients with pancreatic cancer um, were, were, we were seeing no benefit from revolutionary advances in immunotherapy, these immune checkpoint inhibitors, drugs like um, ipilimumab and nivolumab, Yervoy, Abdivo, um, um, while they were uh, allowing extended survival and 30, 40% response rates in patients with metastatic lung disease, metastatic lung cancer, metastatic melanoma, the response rate in pancreatic cancer was just 1%. 1 and so um, pancreatic cancer is classically thought to be an immunologically cold tumor, um, in part because it doesn't have as many mutations as melanoma tumors or lung cancer tumors have. And it was felt to just not have enough mutations to alert the immune system. And so Vinod was puzzled by this and wondered, you know, how we could, um, uh, what we could learn about uh, the immune landscape in human pancreatic cancer. And so um, to look into this, we decided to take an unusual approach. We decided if we were going to find patients who benefited from an immune response, we should look at the very small group of patients in pancreatic cancer who are extraordinary long-term survivors. And these are rare patients. So at Memorial Sloan Kettering, over um, a 10-year uh, period, uh, there were just 82 uh, patients who had a minimum uh, uh, post-operative 
uh, survival of three years and many had uh, longer term survival with some survivors out uh, to 10 years. And we assembled this group of long term survivors, extraordinary survivors. And we, and we also assembled a comparison group of more typical patients who have a median survival of around a year. And all these patients had surgically resected tumors. None of them had metastatic disease. None of them had received metastatic uh, chemotherapy. And we had a bank of tumor material uh, to study for this group of extraordinary uh, resected pancreatic cancer survivors. And we just started looking at what was going on with the immune system in these tumors. So this is multiplexed immunofluorescent staining to characterize T cell um, infiltration into these tumors, which with lots of different markers, I'd point out CD3 is a pan lymphocyte marker marking all T cells uh, in yellow. Uh, CD8 uh, marks uh, cytotoxic uh, T cells and granzyme B is a, a marker of uh, cells actually involved in the killing of adjacent tumor cells. And you can see, uh, this is a typical image from a short-term survivor. They have a cold tumor. There's very few uh, T cells, very few lymphocytes here. Whereas in long-term survivors, we tended to see very dense T cell infiltrates suggestive of an active immune uh, response. And when we quantified that, we found that um, long-term survivors had a threefold uh, increased density of infiltrating uh, CD8 positive T cells and a 12-fold increase in cytolytic CD8 cells expressing granzyme B actively killing uh, tumor cells. And we did, uh, we sequenced the T cell receptors um, in these patients' tumors and found that they had a much more diverse uh, T cell repertoire and using um, uh, gene expression profiling, we saw lots of evidence of active immune response in the long-term versus the short-term uh, survivors. So um, uh, it looks like long-term pancreatic cancer survivors after resection had, have immunologically hot tumors characterized by more T cells, an immunogenic microenvironment and a polyclonal T cell response. So the question is, what, what are all these T cells responding to? We didn't think pancreatic cancer had that many mutations in which um, uh, T cells might be alerted and mount an immune response to the tumor. And so um, at the time, we were increasingly aware that in a lot of um, immune responses, including immune responses to, to melanoma, which is our probably most immunologically hot uh, tumor, the tumor type that's most potent at eliciting an immune response. And in autoimmune diseases like Sjogren's uh, syndrome, like lupus, um, and, in, and, and immune responses in some viral infections, that when folks had studied what the T cells were actually recognizing in in the context of melanoma or autoimmune disease, they were recognizing um, autoantigens and tumor antigens that resembled infectious pathogens. So if you think about it, the immune system never evolved to protect us all against cancer, right? We are in an ancestral environment. Early humans didn't live long enough to get cancer. Um, before they were, you know, eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or something like that. Rather, they um, died of in infections, and the immune system evolved to protect against infection. And so um, we wondered if uh, this um, uh, precedent from uh, autoimmunity, where in, um, in, in a, um, a multiple sclerosis uh, setting, uh, T cells respond um, uh, to uh, autoantigens that resemble micro, mycobacteria. We wondered if in uh, our pancreatic cancer cells, could the T cells be responding to some to, um, mutational antigens on tumor cells that resembled uh, microbial pathogens? And so to, to look into this, we did whole exome sequencing on uh, a, a number of, of tumors, some 50 cell to uh, 50 some tumors and uh, called our mutations. And then uh, we asked in really complicated, I'm not gonna go into this 
uh, computational biology and, um, and bioinformatic techniques, we ask which patients had mutations that re, uh, had sequence homology to sequences from microbial uh, pathogens. And um, when we did this analysis and, and, and created a neoantigen, a mutational antigen quality score based on how a patient's tumor mutations uh, resembled um, antigens from microbial pathogens, we found that it wasn't the number of mutations that defined survival, it was the quality of these mutations and specifically how closely the mutations in a patient's pancreatic cancer mimicked uh, antigens from infectious pathogens that was uh, the driver of survival uh, in these patients in a way that held up in a multivariate analysis. And um, this is the list of, um, of microbial pathogens to which the tumors of long-term pancreatic cancer survivors had mutations that um, had homology to these sequ to the, to sequences from these pathogens. And it's a pretty exotic list of infectious pathogens. We've got uh, dengue uh, fever, we've, we've got ma malaria, we've got yellow fever. Uh, we've, um, and I, I have to remind you, this is, these are patients from the Upper East Side of Manhattan where these diseases aren't exactly um, end endemic. And so we don't think this is prior exposure and prior immunity and cross-reactive immunity. We think this reflects the way the human T cell receptor repertoire evolved. It evolved to protect us all against infection. And when your tumor develops a mutation that, um, uh, that uh, creates a neoantigen that resembles a microbial pathogen, you have um, a brisk immune response and the uh, likelihood of long-term survival. So that's obviously true for a small number of patients, right? I told you how long it took to assemble a cohort of long-term survivors, even at a high volume place um, like uh, Memorial. So the question is, um, how can we elicit this type of response in a, a larger number of patients? Um, before I tell you that, I'll just summarize this uh, first part of the talk then that long-term pancreatic cancer survivors display evidence of enhanced tumor-specific T-cell responses. This is based on neoepitope qualities and specifically tumor neoepitopes, tumor mutations with known homology to epitopes from microbial pathogens are associated with increased immune response and long-term survival. And what I didn't show you in a number of these long-term survivors, we could go uh, back and collect blood as long as 11 years later and still show that these patients had active T cell clones that reacted both to their uh, tumor mutations and to the homologous microbial uh, uh, antigen. So the implications for this are uh, first that this allows us a biomarker to select pancreatic cancer patients uh, and decide which ones we might offer immunotherapy trials. So it's a biomarker for treatment selection. But even more exciting, um, most patients had at least one of these mutations that resembled a microbial pathogen. Um, and it gives us the opportunity it, it, uh, to design individualized peptide-based uh, vaccines to, to boost the immune response to these mutations that we know um, uh, put the immune system on high alert. And so Vinod, without my ongoing involvement, has gone on um, to do something just incredibly um, um, important. And uh, this, this came out in uh, Nature last week. And you know uh, I read about it on the front page of the New York Times when I was on my honeymoon in, in Italy. So working with Ira Melman at Genentech and BioNTech, um, before COVID, before um, RNA vaccines were even a thing, uh, uh, Vinod uh, realized that to make an individual vaccine for every patient's individual mutation, that RNA vaccines might be the way to go. RNA is relatively cheap to synthesize and, and easy to individualize. 
So um, they just reported a trial in nature based on, on this work where uh, pa patients had, had, su had surgery um, and their tumor was removed at surgery. Their uh, tumor and accompanying normal DNA was sequenced. Um, the number of neo mutational neoantigens was identified. And then they custom manufactured individual mRNA vaccines that encoded up to 20 uh, uh, neoantigens, often in a, 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 an array, um, and, and delivered this IV um, uh, after a dose of an immune checkpoint inhibitor. There are a number of priming doses of this vaccine. Um, and then these uh, postoperative patients receive adjuvant fulfirinox, a booster dose, and then, and then follow up. And the results were really remarkable. Um, in a very small phase one trial, um, they had about a 50% response rate as measured by uh, evidence of T cell activation against that patient's specific mutations. And the patients who had a T cell response to the vaccine have had no recurrence now with a median uh, follow-up of 18 months in several, a couple years after a resection, whereas those who did not respond um, uh, had a more typical um, uh, disease course. So this is really revolutionary, right? Pancreatic cancer patients have not benefited uh, to date from immunotherapy, but now by uh, understanding what mutations alert the, uh, the, uh, the immune system, um, um, uh, I think we're on the verge of offering our pancreatic cancer patients effective uh, immunotherapy and the chance for long-term uh, survival. Um, so in addition now to um, uh, PARP inhibitor maintenance therapy for patients with mutations in the breast cancer genes, we can think about um, uh, PEP, uh, RNA vaccines, uh, immuno-oncology trials for patients with high-quality neoepitopes. Um, I'm not going to talk about this additional therapy. I want to uh, uh, end with just one more vignette about reprogramming uh, the cancer epi epigenome. Um, and this is work by Surajit Dara, who's gone off uh, to start a company based on uh, his, his uh, findings. And so um, epigenetic modifications are um, what regulate the differentiation of both normal cells and malignant cells, right? So all of our cells have the same genome, the same uh, 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 DNA code, um, and the epigenome, um, if, if the DNA code or are, are the alphabet of our genome, it's said that the epigenome is, are the punctuation marks that determine how that alphabet is, is read, right? And, um, you know, our human uh, genomes are 3 billion uh, nucleotides long, right? The equivalent of, of 1,000 copies of War and Peace all folded up in our single cells. The length of, um, of DNA in one human cell is six foot eight inches, um, which I looked it up was the average size of uh, a power forward in the Denny Crum era, uh, era of uh, Louisville uh, basketball, right? So six feet, eight inches of DNA packed into each of our individual uh, cells. And the way that gets packed is through um, these uh, histone modifications and DNA methylation, such that the linear DNA is wrapped around these nucleosomes and folded into chromatin and organized either as um, euchromatin, which is open accessible chromatin in which genes can be expressed, or uh, this densely packed heterochromatin, which is closed, inaccessible to transcription factors and, um, and silence. And um, variable um, um, epigenetic modifications and variable packaging of different segments of the genome into heterochromatin and euchromatin are the way that uh, this is uh, a Waddington uh, epigenetic landscape that cells uh, go down different valleys um, in, in this landscape to become a different uh, cell types. And um, in terms of pancreatic cancer, we can think of pancreatic cancer cells, yes, of having genetic mutations, but we've learned that it's not the mutations that drive 
uh, the difference between a primary tumor and a metastatic tumor. The mutational profile, there's no, there's no metastasis mutation. The mutational profile of primary and metastatic cancer cells is essentially the same. They differ in their epigenome. They differ in um, their um, uh, the, the way their DNA is packaged. And so we can think uh, uh, of this normal pathway for differentiation of uh, a, a cell or a ball rolling down the hill uh, to a normal adult cell. And cancer involves going a bit uh, backwards uh, up up the hill um, and becoming a, a de-differentiated cancer cell. And perhaps pediatric cancers over here, ne they stall halfway down the hill and never fully uh, differentiate. So the question is, what if we can reprogram cancer cells epigenetically and get all of these balls down uh, to the normal uh, cell valleys um, uh, on this epigenetic landscape? And uh, so we did the first ever genome, epigenome-wide mapping of the pancreatic cancer epigenome. And uh, for those of you who are interested, we used a, a, a technique called a tac seq uh, to do this. I won't go into details. It involves a transposon uh, that can only insert into open euchromatin. And then we were able to sequence that and know in every uh, individual pancreatic cancer cell, what part of the genome is open, accessible, what part of the genome is closed. And what we found is that about a thousand uh, 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 loci in the human epigenome out of a hundred thousand that really define short versus long uh, term um, uh, re recurrence. In, in the, the column that's topped in blue here are patients who had not um, a, a re recurred uh, within a year after surgery. And the patients in red here are the patients who had recurred. And these are these 1,000 peaks. And you can see how they define the two groups, a, a, a positive prognosis group and a negative prognosis group. And this is the way these two groups map out in terms of actuarial uh, survival. And we also found that within these opening, open chromatin peaks, that there were certain transcription factor binding sites, um, including uh, one for a, a transcription factor called HNF1 beta. And we found that um, these, the tumors in the non-recurrent group had robust staining for HNF1 beta, while in the recurrent group, they, they did not. And this also stratified survival. Um, so this was a huge effort um, involving um, whole epigenome attack se sequencing and bioinformatic analysis uh, that took months and generated some interesting results. But uh, this was never going to be clinically applicable. There, there, there wouldn't be time um, uh, to generate all this information in a clinically relevant time frame, and this would, was just too expensive to ever be clinically relevant. Um, uh, so Surgeon had their great idea uh, to turn all this into a little simple uh, micro array um, and put those 1,000 spots of uh, DNA onto um, a glass slide uh, to make this a really simple uh, one-hour test. And this just shows that this attack array technique, when you compare it to the attack seek uh, technique, they had really wonderful concordance. So greatly simplified the method, now to the point of being uh, clinically, uh, 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 being accomplishable in a clinically relevant time frame. And when he applied this attack array and this HNF1 beta immunohistochemistry, he was able to define uh, uh, four groups of patients according to uh, their score on these two um, assays um, that had sevenfold differences in uh, post-operative disease-free uh, survival, which you can see uh, the, the poor prognosis group here having a median uh, survival of uh, only a matter of months, and the, the positive prognosis group here having a, a survival that approached four, four years. So, um, and this is all based on their epigenome. So we now have about 40 epigenetic drugs that are in the process of uh, getting evaluated and approved by the FDA. And they're a real hot topic in cancer therapy. Can we reprogram cancer cells? And um, if I was in this group of patients who uh, were predicted to do very poorly uh, based on the organization of their chromatin in the epigenome, 
I'd, I'd be someone who wanted to go on a clinical trial with one of those drugs. If I was one of these patients in blue with a very, very favorable epigenome, I wouldn't want anyone monkeying with it. And I wouldn't go near an epigenetic you know, drug with a 10 foot uh, pole. So this becomes now another biomarker uh, to select patients for clinical trials involving uh, epi, epigenetic uh, therapy. And so if we can take uh, patients with these poor epigenetic profiles where the um, uh, and turn them into patients with good epigenetic profiles. We now have a clinical trial underway at Dartmouth evaluating this approach as a way to select patients to go on clinical trials for epigenetic uh, therapy. So this becomes another potential biomarker to start individualizing treatment to pancreatic cancer patients the way we individualize treatment with many other tumor types. And um, um, I, I think there are many other likely biomarkers out there that are likely to be discovered um, um, beyond the, uh, the, the time frame of, of my professional career. But I think it's a really e e exciting uh, time uh, to, to pursue these kinds of studies. Um, so what about the epigenome of, of surgeon scientists? So um, i tell you a little bit of a personal vignette. I, I, I grew up loving biology. I majored in biology in college. I did some lab research in college. Um, I went to medical school and spent four years, you know, memorizing facts and learning how to take care of patients and really kind of got away from um, a longstanding love of biology and, and research, I think it's fair to say. And I did my general surgery training at, at Yale. And um, I had the um, opportunity to spend uh, two years in a cell biology lab at Yale. I went out after my second year um, and had an incredible experience. Got really lucky, you know, the project worked, the experiments worked the first time. I didn't know what I was doing, but it all went, it all went remarkably uh, well. Um, and then I did three more years of residency um, and then two more years of fellowship. And that was, those were in the years between 1990 and 1995, which is basically when molecular biology happened. It's when uh, labs, you know, run of the mill labs started using, um, uh, you know, DNA and, and cloning genes and working with plasmids. And so I came back out my first year on the faculty at Vanderbilt. And I, even though I'd had a great research training, I needed to retool. And so as an assistant professor, there was a young faculty member there, Jennifer Peaton Paul, who subsequently went on to direct the Vanderbilt Cancer Center. And she graciously accepted me as an assistant professor, but really a glorified postdoc in her lab. And I kind of had to retrain. Her. And, um, and it all ended up you know, going, going well. Um, although I can't say I necessarily think that we've uh, yet optimize a model for a uh, training young uh, surgeon uh, scientist. So I just, in the remaining five minutes, I just want to go over uh, some of the ways um, I think the, the epigenome necessary to become especially a successful lab-based surgeon scientist is, is, is changing. And just go over a couple of these things. Kelly mentioned team science. I think in, in this um, scientific environment, um, in this funding environment, Team science is an absolute um, must. And there's actually a formal science of team science where people can be trained in how to be good team science um, uh, investigators. And I look back very fondly on, on early days of my lab where we published papers with, with just two authors, a trainee and myself as the senior author. And these were you know, uh, classical kind of small scale biology papers that I look back on, you know, very fondly. But that that was years ago. Um, and I actually looked back a couple of years ago and looked at how the number of authors um, on papers coming out of our lab had changed over um, over a almost uh, uh, um, 30 year time frame. So uh, in these papers that, that's co that have come out of my group, the authorship range goes from two uh, to 72. And in, in this decade here, the, the median number of authors was five. Um, in the next decade, it went up to 8.5 and the subsequent decade up to 11. 
But if um, you look at the highest impact papers that were published in Nature, Science, Cell, Cancer Cell, JAMA, there was an average of 30 some authors uh, on these papers. And this is just an example of that. Two papers, one in Nature, one in Cancer Cell, 38 authors from 13 institutions, 43 authors from 12 institutions. And this work would have never been done without these teams of, um, of surgical oncologists, medical oncologists, molecular uh, biologists, computational uh, bi bi biologists, radiation oncologists. And it just, I think, exemplifies the way we uh, do science uh, today. And I'd also uh, suggest that this type of team science offers trainees optimal training opportunities. So uh, they get to be the quarterback, right? None of the, none of the senior faculty members on, on these papers know everything about the entire project, right? I can't understand the computational biology. Someone else can't understand the epigenetics. Um, but by putting trainees in the middle of these types of teams, um, you really give them the opportunity to interact uh, with a broad array of scientists and really um, um, extend their, their people management skills and their scientific management skills. So I don't think it's any accident that the two lead authors on, on these two, uh, two of the higher profile papers from my lab, Vinod and Luisa Escobar Hoyos, Vinod now an, assist, an associate professor at Memorial, Luisa an assistant professor at Yale, you know, both won AACR Career Development Awards. They're both Damon Runyon fellows, I think because they were able to quarterback uh, these big team science teams. So I think uh, that's one point I want, I want to make. And then I don't have to tell this group in this department where mentorship has loomed so large, just how important mentorship is. Um, and I think that um, it's not just a must, but we, we as surgical scientists need surgical mentors and we need non-surgical mentors uh, to extend the breadth of our scientific, the breadth and depth of our scientific uh, training. I think that bioinformatics and computer program are now a must in any type of research, in lab-based research, in healthcare delivery science, um, and Although I'm a little bit too old to learn how to program in R, I do believe it's easier to learn how to do computer programming than it is to do surgery, and that anyone who's interested in a career in academic surgery ought to, ought to learn it. And then I just want to emphasize the need to be all, all in, that, um, that I think that surgical science you know, needs to be done um, as a passion, as a lifelong a commitment to discovery and not just a path towards, you know, early career advancement of getting a great fellowship, et cetera. You have to love it. It requires appropriate training and optimized training paradigms. And I'm a big proponent. I'm a little loath to speak out with members of the American Board of Surgery in the room, but I believe we, we might be able to shorten the training time as uh, in general surgery and shift research training into fellowships, be it in kind of primary uh, care general surgery or in uh, surgical subspecialties to get surgical training closer to the period of uh, starting one's own academic career to avoid, for instance, the, the, the issues I talked about in my, in my training. Um, I talk about passionate commitment to science as a lifelong uh, pursuit, and then, of course, protected time. And um, in my experience, um, absolute protected time, while never, it's never going to be absolute for a surgeon with, uh, with patients in the ICU, but uh, blocked out protected time is important to do the work, but it's most important so that you can tell your scientific collaborators, I will be at that meeting at 3 p.m. on Thursday, and they can count on you. To be a reliable collaborator involves some relatively inviolate uh, protected uh, time. And then I think a life in academic uh, surgery and surgical research involves both economic choices and, and lifestyle uh, choices, right? There was a, there was a time when I, I, I longed uh, for that Lexus, but you know, settled for my 1990 Honda Accord that I drove into into the ground. Right, look back on that fondly now. 
um, uh, economic choices, I think, can sometimes drive what we do. You know, my first house that I bought after my fellowship was way too big and cost way too much money and put stresses, you know, on my family um, in, in ways I look back on now. A little bungalow might have been uh, uh, better, but those those choices allow lifestyle choices. So by kind of stepping away from you know being the biggest big shot surgeon in town uh, to an academic uh, lab based physician scientist, and I was able to coach my kids' little league teams. Right, so there's there's benefits uh, to all this as well, and the biggest benefit is the joy of uh, surgery and the joy of discovery. Um, you know, and my mentor in Baltimore, John Cameron, was fond of, you know, saying, if you if you find a job and you love it, you'll never have to work another day in your life. Right. And that's how I know many of us who've had successful careers in academic uh, surgery um, uh, uh, fields. So those are just my thoughts on uh, and how we might uh, need to reprogram our epigenomes uh, uh, with the goal of becoming a successful uh, surgeon scientist. Uh, so with that, I just want to thank uh, Ke Kelly uh, again um, and just acknowledge again what an honor it is to be the gross lecturer here in one of the country's greatest uh, departments of, of surgery. Thank you. Well, uh, unfortunately, I've been trying to gen uh, epigenetically reprogram the people who decided to test the alarm systems throughout your entire gross lectureship. Uh, so I apologize for, for that. Uh, thank you for a brilliant lecture. You can see why Dr. Leach is, is one of the most brilliant surgeon scientists uh, in the world and has made incredible contributions. I would urge all of you, you know, it's easy in, in treating patients. You know, an example is uh, in an area I'm very familiar with in melanoma. It wasn't a decade ago we had no treatments that worked. We just assumed the only treatment that was worthwhile was surgery. And now, of course, the immunotherapy, targeted therapy has revolutionized the treatment of patients with melanoma who have stage four disease that are cured with, with targeted therapy and immunotherapy in many cases. I haven't mean, heard of it previously when, when it wasn't long ago. We all just accepted, well, melanoma is a disease that doesn't respond to these kind of treatments. We just you know, some, some people didn't accept that. And that's the translational science that led to this revolution. And, and pancreatic cancer is one of those diseases that many of us have accepted over the years that, hey, it doesn't work. Immunotherapy doesn't work. Chemotherapy doesn't work that great. It's a little better than it used to be. And most of the people are gonna, almost everybody's gonna die eventually of, of pancreatic cancer, even if they're resectable. And what you saw today is that just like engineers find that there's no problem they can't solve, and that's the challenge of their profession. Uh, scientists, that's the challenge of our profession is to say, these are the most difficult problems. Dr. Leach is, is, has uh, spent his career trying to address some of the most difficult problems in cancer. And, uh, and we're on the verge of solving. So uh, I hope that his lecture has stimulated many of you to be enthusiastic about discovery and, and, and science and surgery. And many of you are involved in doing research years and advanced degrees and other things. Uh, but as I often tell people, it's just as easy to spend your career trying to answer important questions as it is <laughs> to answer trivial questions. So you might as well pick an important one. This is just a fantastic example. So there is a question or a comment at, here somewhere. Where's Dr. Wiesti? Oh, right here. He's right here. Okay. So I, I don't know. I know just enough about immunology to know that it's important. And we started a division of immunotherapy several years wow. ago. Wonderful. It's a really high functioning division. Dr. Luisi got his PhD uh, in that division and, and uh, is going to go on and be a surgical oncologist at some point. But, so he's going to help me frame this question. The, what you described with the, the mutations uh, in pancreatic cancer related to microbial uh, 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 mutations or uh, um, antigens yeah. uh, sounds a whole lot like an area that Dr. Wiesti is an expert in and we have expertise in trained immunity. Uh, your comments and thoughts about that, Dr. Wiesti, frame a good question for Dr. Leach. Well, 
Thank you. No pressure. Uh, well, he did talk about mutation of burden as it relates to other pathogens, uh, or I mean, viral pathogens. But I was curious about mutational burden as it relates to maybe the gut microbiome. Yeah. And whether you looked at that in terms of uh, native microbes that are, you know, homeopathic to the to the yeah. patient themselves. Yeah, I know it's a, it's a it's a, obviously a, a, a huge next step to understand how the microbiome influences um, anti-pancreatic tumor immunity. One of my other uh, former postdocs, Florencia McAllister, is at MD Anderson, and she's found um, again in good prognosis patients and bad prognosis pancreatic cancer patients they have different microbiomes, and she can actually take the microbiome of a good prognosis patient and put it in some pancreatic mice with pancreatic cancer and make them live longer, and vice versa with the negative uh, prognosis patients' um, microbiome. So she's actually starting a program, a fecal transplantation, a clinical trial in pancreatic cancer you know, patients. And she's a much better immunologist than I am. So um, she's done work in TH17 cells and how they're influenced by the microbiome. But just the thought of doing fecal transplantation as a treatment you know, for pancreatic cancer is kind of mind blowing to me. Our colorectal surgeons are very excited to know that the secret that everything lies within the colon. Yes. yes. Uh, yes. Martin, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, I mean, great job, Hi, Steve. I mean, Good obviously, see, yeah. I have, I share the huge amount of enthusiasm with disease. I, I mean, we are making significant strides. Yes. I mean, just in the 21 years I've been practicing, yes. we have really, you know, uh, I think improved the overall quality of life time. Yes, yes. these patients do die, but... Yep. That 36 months or that 50 months they have is a whole lot better than it used to be. Absolutely. Obviously, when we were training. I guess it's a two fold question. One is, is around obviously, don't get me wrong, if you get the T cell CD8 and you win that lottery, yeah. uh, I mean, your survival is great. Yeah. We've seen now a groundswell of now neoadjuvant chemotherapy needs to be given to everybody. Right. Is there a potential adverse yeah. uh, effect? So you have that CD8 lottery win. If you like, if you just leave me alone, I'll do great. Yeah. But we're going to hammer you with 12 cycles of monopyrinox even before you get your surgery. Yeah. Are we in that process now where maybe we have gone too far into the new Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to that question, um, Rob, but it, it, we clearly don't know anything about optimal you know, sequencing of chemotherapy and immunotherapy and pancreatic cancer. And I think what you're proposing, you know, rings true and is, is entirely valid. I think that'll be, you know, now that we are on the verge of effective immunotherapy, we need to think about how we, we sequence those. And specifically and intentionally in Vinod's trial, the immunotherapy was given before Fulferinox adjuvant chemotherapy, right? So with all those all those is issues in 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 mind, but how we how we sequence these things is the next front frontier, I think. And then the last piece, is just around you know surgical stimulation, as you know, Jen Yen Yang has been looking at sort of an implantable era way to augment type of immune therapy. Clearly, I have passion around IRE. There's some data around radiation therapy, and then there's also. Yeah intraluminal or a device called a Renova RX, where you can put a yep. balloon catheter in between the gastrointestinal artery yep. and infuse. Do you think that will potentially help this type of epigenetic or type of stimulation that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, you know, that, so you're, you're referring in part to this, you know, historic abscopal effect, right? Like a pa patients with a, a, a sarcoma on one arm, a sarcoma on the other arm, you radiate one arm and, and the tumor regresses on the other arm, felt to be due to, the, to tumor lysis, the release of antigens and the elicitation of a brisk immune re response. And um, that, that's like unbelievably exciting to me, you know, to think that rather than, you know, subject patients to classical, you know, five or six weeks of, you know, traveling for us in Northern New England, people come from hundreds of miles away to come to Dartmouth. And um, and if they could come in for a brief, you know, high dose period as a way to sensitize their tumors, you know, to immunotherapy, uh, you know, what, what, wow. Um, so I think, um, uh, uh, I think there's a lot of promise in that regard. I, we don't, we don't have any active work going on in that, in that area right now, but it's, it's really exciting. 
I think our, our time is, is uh, run out, but I'm going to, uh, we have a couple of gifts I have to present to you. <laughs> I, I don't know which ones are the right ones here. Hopefully. I don't know. Yeah. Well, here. Have a, that, and that's, uh, there's something in there. And this is the traditional julep cup. You probably got one last time you were here. We'll teach you how to use it at the track later on. <laughs> yeah, you got another picture with me. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lil. Well, looking younger. <laughs> Thanks, bro. All right, man. Okay. All right, quick break, and then we'll get back with Dr. Kirkland. All right, so uh, I've already. Uh, introduced briefly Dr. Kirkland to you, who's a professor in the Department of Medicine and directs the palliative care program at Dartmouth. And uh, her talk, while you heard in the first hour from Dr. Leach, uh, um, a talk about a high level science. We're going to talk a little bit more about humanism in uh, medicine, and I think complements the uh, the uh, talk Dr. Leach gave uh, in a different side of of what we do as as surgeons and surgeon scientists and um, and Dr. Kirkland, we're very appreciative of you uh, uh, agreeing to take part in this uh, gross lectureship event. So thank you. We look forward to your talk. Thank you. And it's a real honor for me to be part of this visit and to get a chance to talk to a group of surgeons, surgical trainees, and students. Um, and it will be a little different from Steve's talk, but I think complimentary. Um, so people think of medicine as a scientific discipline. And to a large degree, it is. Science provides the tools to demonstrate what is possible, as Steve just so beautifully outlined. And it also enables ever expanding possibilities leading to new technologies that allow us to cure previously incurable diseases. Spent the whole last hour on that. And to control others and often allowing people to live longer and better than they would have even a decade ago. The new technologies though also create challenges for medicine. Challenges that involve moral choices. Increasingly, we have the means to keep bodies alive using machines and interventions to replace natural organ functions to sometimes even for months and even years. And sometimes those interventions allow time for reversible problems to be fixed or injuries to heal, but there's circumstances when life-sustaining interventions are used to support the existence of a body indefinitely when no real recovery can take place. In those cases, technology can hold a person in a kind of limbo, making it also impossible for those who love them to move on. Science can't answer the questions about when to use the technologies that science has made available and when it may, may be better not to. But it is essential that we grapple with these questions and that we help our patients and healthcare team members to do so also. Should we stop blood transfusions for an elderly man with leukemia so he can return to his beloved home with hospice support when we know his life will be shorter when the transfusions stop? Should we remove the ventilator from a young girl who's had a devastating brain injury? when removing it will lead to her death, but maintaining it will likely subject her to a life completely dependent on others, but unable to interact meaningfully with them. Should we offer to perform surgery in a critically ill person when the risk of dying with or without it is exceedingly high? These moments when there's no obvious path to a good outcome, and yet a decision must be made are unavoidable in clinical medicine. While they often trigger generalized feelings of unease in clinicians, 
they're not always recognized for what they are, moments of moral tension. For those accustomed to turning to science for help solving clinical challenges, the failure of science to provide guidance can be unsettling. In the face of this discomfort, many clinicians simply suppress their distress and keep moving. And while this is a natural human response, clinicians and patients pay a price for such speed. Repeated episodes accumulate unexamined. Ultimately for clinicians, this can numbness or apathy of burnout can be the result. And it can leave patients and families feeling adrift, left alone to choose from among what feel like and really are no good options. Any choice comes with regret or guilt because none of the choices leads to an outcome anyone wants. So if scientific training is inadequate, how can we prepare clinicians to recognize and respond to situations of moral tension? This part of clinical practice requires a different way of knowing, one that can be found in the study of humanities and in particularly in the study of literature. To prepare clinicians to help patients navigate ambiguity and uncertainty and to face moral choices, a case can be made for simply teaching them to be better, more aesthetic readers. The term aesthetic reading is borrowed from the field of narrative theory. It's a term coined by a narrative researcher named Louise Rosenblatt to describe reading in which the focus is on the experience of reading itself. What happens between the reader and the text that yields the meaning, the feelings, and the deeper understanding. It's the kind of reading we do when we read a good novel or a poem. Rosenblatt contrasts aesthetic reading with what she calls efferent reading. Efferent reading is reading for the residue, that is for needed information. This might sound more familiar. Efferent reading is what we do when we read the instructions for using a fire extinguisher. We're not looking for meaning, we're looking for how to get the fire put out as quickly as possible. Or how a student might skim through cliff notes before a class to get a quick summary of a plot or a list of characters. Medical school offers many opportunities to hone our efferent reading skills, which are critical for efficient and effective practice of medicine. Here are some examples differential diagnosis of hyponatremia, studying for the boards, and even approaching someone who's bleeding to death um, requires a quick efferent read to find out where is the bleeding coming from and how can I stop it. Um, in the face of moral questions though, we need to read in a different way, way. We need to read aesthetically. We need to go deeper into the story, experiencing the nuances of situations, of our patients' values, and even reading ourselves to be aware of the biases and perspectives that we bring to the table. How many of you read for pleasure? occasionally, many of you. And so many of you already have a sense of what happens when we read, but reading literary fiction or good books has been shown to enhance our ability to imagine the thoughts and feelings of others. Keith Oatley, a cognitive psychologist and a novelist has called reading the mind's flight simulator. As we turn ourselves over to a good book, we cede control of pace and tempo to the author, letting the story unfold as it does. We encounter characters whom we like and dislike, whom we identify with, sympathize with, and we encounter worlds that are both totally unfamiliar and strikingly similar to our own. While we don't control the narrative, we are anything but passive as we 
develop hypotheses about plot in chapter one that might need to be revised as chapter two provides new information. And we make judgments about characters who then surprise us. We fill in gaps left to our imagination, feeling weather, uh, seeing landscapes, hearing characters' voices. We see how complex characters respond to challenges, and we imagine how we might respond to similar challenges. We wrestle with ambiguity, with uncertainty, with suspense. Good books require aesthetic reading. And while efferent reading gives us access to critical information so that we can act quickly and decisively when time is short, aesthetic re reading requires that we slow down. Like good fiction, some clinical stories need aesthetic readers. When faced with what feel like no good choices, the narrative skills that we develop through reading aesthetically can be more important than scientific information. We need to be able to listen carefully, curiously, setting aside our own perspectives and creating space for other stories that reveal the hopes and values of other people. We need to draw on our imagination to consider possible futures, exploring scenarios, how they might unfold, considering how they might evoke guilt or regret or relief. We need to tolerate ambiguity, uncertainty, and inconsistency as we explore options with patients. And we need to be creative in co-constructing stories that are true to both what we understand to be possible as physicians and what patients and families value and prioritize basically palliative care. As an aside, let me just mention that even when we read the same story, whether literary or clinical, we often see very different things. For instance, spend a moment looking at this painting that I've used as a text several times with groups, including surgeons, at different points in their career. A group of interns looking at this patient, at this uh, painting, saw the technical concrete aspects of the scene. They pointed out there's too much blood. They're not holding the tourniquet tightly enough. Not a smart choice to use a guillotine amputation. No extra skin to make a flap. The blue leg is unrealistic. The guy at the head of the table has three hands. When I drew their attention to the faces of the men standing around the table, faces that to me depict anguish, fear, disgust, resignation, the interns saw boredom. Now a group of more seasoned surgeons looking at the same painting did not focus at all on the technical aspects of the painting or of the anatomy. While a nurse in the audience was struck by the suffering suggested by the patient's taut muscles and grimacing face, the surgeon's gaze rested on the surgeon himself. They pointed out that while everyone else looks away, the surgeon stays focused on the patient and on the job to be done. So these different people, including me, looking at the exact same text see very different things. We bring our own perspectives to the situation. So today I want to, in the time that I have left, share an experience of practicing this kind of reading of a, of a poem with a group of medical residents. And I think it's gonna illustrate the power both of the process of reading itself and of the way the content of a literary text can amplify the benefits of reading. So to make explicit to the residents that I work with what they're doing unconsciously when they read, I use this process that I call slow reading. So we start with our papers folded, showing only the title of this William Stafford poem that I used as a text for this example. 
One of the resonance reads the title out loud, traveling through the dark. And I ask them to notice and then to share images, thoughts, or feelings that come to mind in response just to this title. You can follow along and do the same if you'd like. Walking in the woods on a dark night, one of them says. Speeding along in a car on a road at night, says another. Being in the dark means not knowing what to do, one offers. Confusion, fear, uncertainty. We talk about the choice of the word traveling, considering how it differs from driving or running, whether it implies something more intentional than just an evening commute. We notice that dark invokes a different sense than night. And I observe that the use of the gerund form traveling creates the sense of liminality. It places us right in the middle of an unfinished story. So we pause and you may pause to kind of marvel at how actively our minds respond to just four words, the title of a poem, the way we see images and the way we automatically generate hypotheses about what might happen next. So next I instruct them to fold their papers down revealing just the first line of the poem. Traveling through the dark, I found a deer. Taking turns reading, the resonance and I make our way through the poem like this, literally revealing one line at a time and pausing after each to share responses. What does this line do? How does this line change or add to the lines that came before? Periodically, we revisit the title in the context of where we are in the poem. And that's the process of slow reading, which is designed both to make the encounter with the text of the poem more digestible, because many residents come into the room saying, I don't read poetry. Um, and to surface what happens when we read, when we encounter a story that someone else is telling. So when the traveler become, encounters this deer dead on the edge of the dark and narrow Wilson Road, Wilson River Road, he pulls over with the intention of rolling the carcass into the canyon, explaining that it is the usual practice in such situations to avoid further harm to other drivers who might come along. This opening stanza is simple, almost banal, and it's recounting of what we recognize as a common occurrence. We do in New Hampshire, and you probably do in Kentucky, a common occurrence on a rural, occurrence on a rural road. Its cadence is regular, its language is plain. It's such a familiar story, the reader might wonder, why is it even being told? A close reader, one paying attention to the story structure, as well as the plot, might notice a shift in the rhythm of the last line of the first stanza with a sense of unease. Its last six syllables receive equal emphasis. Reading it aloud, it is impossible not to slow down. That road is narrow to swerve might make more dead. Slowing down, we may wonder, is the storyteller reluctant to tell the rest of the story? If so, why? Will the poem contain more death? The break between the stanzas gives him and us a chance to pause and reflect before the story presses on. As residents take turns reading aloud the next two stanzas, we leave behind the measured rhythms of the dutiful driver performing a well-rehearsed act of safety on this rural road and into the choppy rhythm of unease. Our narrator stumbles over words just as he stumbled back of the car toward the dead deer. We are with him in the glow of the red tail light as he notices the deer's large belly. And as he finds pulling the carcass off the road that while the doe itself is cold and stiffening, her side was warm. Her fawn lay there waiting, alive, still, never to be born. 
As they unravel the jumble of the story, the situation slowly dawns on the residents. Some of them groan. The almost automatic act of rolling a dead animal into the canyon to clear the road has been interrupted by the unexpected complexity of a still living unborn fawn. Everything feels different, heavy. A resonant reading the third stanza aloud ends with the line, beside that mountain road, I hesitated. And I pause at that break between stanzas, wanting to hold us in this moment of moral tension. The room is quiet. The resonants shift uncomfortably in their seats. And I ask them, and I'll ask you, now what? What should the traveler do? What would you do? For a minute, they say nothing. Then everyone is talking at once. Some say the situation is futile, that the traveler should just push the deer into the canyon as usual. Others insist, no, he should do a C-section, try to save the fawn. Some argue animatedly about practicality and logistics. Does he have a knife? What would he do with the fawn if he delivered it? Some invoke principles. Life is sacred. We must try to preserve it. Others are resigned. The fawn will die anyway. Then one of them blurts. This is just like the intensive care unit. Others agree, it's a no-win situation. Do I keep going with intensive care because the patient wants to live knowing he's going to die anyway? Or try to convince the family to let us shift to comfort measures? Either way, the patient dies, it's awful for everyone. Others join in, it's terrible, it doesn't matter what you do. It feels like there's no right answer. I just try to get through it as fast as I can. Many of the residents agree. It's too painful to draw it out. As they talk, I'm thinking about my own recent encounter with the parents of a young boy whose brain was severely injured in a car crash on an icy road. Despite the overwhelming odds against recovery to a level of function that an awareness that would meet the parents' criteria for a life worth living, and what parent wants to make a decision like that for their child. They chose to take all the steps necessary to continue to keep his comatose body alive indefinitely as they prayed for a miracle. I understood and respected the decision, yet I hated the prolongation of this liminal period, this requirement to hold myself with them in this period of not knowing. The residents pull my attention back to the conference room, pleading for release from this moment of hesitation. We need to know what happens. Let us read to the end. And though they and maybe you are eager to know how the story ends, there's much to be gained from this moment of hesitation, standing with the traveler and the deer in the dark night. As the residents advocate, sometimes passionately for different options, and hear the case for the other side, a gradual realization emerges. There is no right answer for this traveler. And soon after this come, realization comes as corollary. There is no wrong answer either. When there is no right and no wrong answer, the hesitation itself may be the moral response. The grappling toward an answer, the time taken to weigh options, play them out, sit with the discomfort, and to feel what we feel. As we slow down, we create space for the experience of others and time for perspectives other than our own to be voiced and explained. In this time and space, we can gain a deeper tolerance for other points of view and for ambiguity as we explore possible scenarios and where they might lead, we come to a greater awareness that there's much that we don't control. 
that undesired outcomes can and do occur independently of decisions available to us. Paradoxically, taking time to experience the grief, the anger, and the feelings of powerlessness can lead to a lightening of distress. So back in the poem, Stafford holds his readers in this moment of moral tension through another excruciating stanza as the traveler pauses, stepping out of time and thinks hard for us all. As the engine purrs and the exhaust glares, we, along with the traveler, hear the wilderness listen. It's not until the final couplet, indeed the very last line of the poem, that we will at last reach the resolution that the resonance craved. He makes a choice, but by the time he does, it matters less which choice he makes than it does that he felt the weight of the choice. And I'm not going to tell you what happens just yet, but I'll put up the whole poem at the end. In clinical medicine, it's sometimes obvious what to do, which technology to use, how to achieve the outcomes our patients are hoping for. But sometimes we, like Stafford's narrator, are traveling through the dark faced with situations that have no easy answers. While our impulse may be to speed up, slowing down and using our aesthetic reading skills is the better response. The value for patients, families, and for healthcare teams is in creating the time and space for different versions of a story to be fully explored. In this process, both unwanted outcomes and feelings of grief and loss can be decoupled from right or wrong decisions. In these situations where there is no clearly right or wrong path forward, the ending may be less important than the integrity of the journey itself. If we recognize this, drawing on skills that can be polished through the study of humanities, or simply just by making time to read a novel or a poem every evening, we will have opportunities to lessen misplaced regret, guilt, and self-criticism, not just protecting our patients and their families, but also immunizing ourselves in a way against the development of moral distress and burnout. So let me put up the full poem and give you a chance to see what happened and close with time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. That really uh, is a thought provoking and uh, a different way for our residents to really think about uh, the difficult situations. This is the second hour of our Friday morning conference where usually we have our uh, morbidity and mortality conference. And every week, it seems, we discuss utility, palliative care, whether it's in trauma or cancer or everything else, and and the importance of, of really engaging our patients in meaningful uh, goals of care discussions and almost invariably the, uh, uh, well, not maybe invariably, but but so very often we comment that, you know, the, that less than uh, ideal outcomes that we encounter are related at the very beginning to the goals of care and, and indications for operation and the considerations for, you know, whether or not we, we should be doing uh, this operation or this procedure under these circumstances, and whether it's really going to benefit the patients or not. We, have, I, we understand that we're often put in a box where family and patient wishes are that we need to do everything. And then, and then we see how badly that ends up. So um, 
uh, I think this has been very thought provoking and hopefully eye opening for some of our trainees that was, might have some questions or comments. You know, faculty, residents, students. That's right, guys. Thank you very much. Another one of the talks. I wanted to ask you at the institution. Now that we talk also about my credit management, when is the right time to involve palliative care in a condition that is different from the religious problem, almost universally deadly? Is it a personalized approach or is it a everybody's palliative care? And when at the institution, what's the timing of involved palliative care in a diagnosis of my credit cancer? No, I, know. I think it's individualized. So, um, the, a lot of this work is work that you are already doing as a surgeon. You know what's possible, you know what options are, and you can elicit what patients are hoping for in the case of pancreatic cancer to live as well as they can for as long as they can. In fact, that's probably what most people want. I think that um, palliative care can be helpful when um, Patients or families are having difficulty making a decision or not in agreement about a decision about what, what should happen next, or when it's not clear which path forward matches up best with their values. I think we can we can add to that conversation um, and explore values and work through inconsistencies. And then we can help support people through what can sometimes be difficult, just symptoms and post-operative, you know, adjustment to life as well. So I think it's individualized. Um, it's probably never too early or too late to, to bring us in to be part of a team. What's your, what's your sense? Do you have a, a general approach or do you individualize it? Well, I just close with that I don't treat from a risk I'm sure okay. I don't know, but I'm married to a palliative care provider and I hear the story from both sides. Yeah. And, uh, it seems to me that as you said it's never too late or Meaning, it's never too early. Eventually palliative care needs to be involved because the symptoms are going to be overwhelming. And as you pointed out, this process are very different. It takes a lot of time and yeah, and you'd be surprised at how little time it can take if you upfront create a little space for a patient to tell you what's the most important thing for me to know about you. Not always, but often that provides you critical information that leads you to know I'm not recommending a Whipple for this person or I am. I think in a way, the more um, an interesting question is when in breast cancer to involve palliative care because people live so long with breast cancer and yet when they reach the late stages, it can be uh, you know, kind of a mess for people because they haven't been expecting that things would ever go badly because they've lived so well and so long with breast cancer. So that's also an interesting challenge, I think, for our collaborations is how do how do you how do we prepare people with um, controllable cancers for the possibility that at some point in the future things may take a different course. So your your lecture really comes on the heels of this discussion we had last weekend at Grand Rounds given by our senior surgical oncology fellow, Dr. Zach Sanders, who, who you'll meet, uh, who talked about surgical palliative care and uh, and uh, you know uh, the great thing about the, the specialty now of palliative care, which didn't seem to exist when I was in training. Yeah, no, it didn't. Uh, and, and now there are surgeons who are specialized specialized in palliative care. Um, is that there are experts who can help, incredibly help our patients at, at the end of life. Um, uh, the, the bad aspect of it, I think, and is that many people now see that you can just outsource this, right? The, yeah. the, the difficult discussions and difficult 
uh, 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 conversation with patients and families. Uh, you can't just write the, con the consult and, and put it in Epic, you know, the consult palliative care, and that's your involvement in, in, uh, in the end of life discussions. As the, as the surgeons who are treating these patients, uh, you know, and have long term relationship with them, it's, it's really integral to what we do that we have to, to, uh, to help uh, ease patients over to the other side uh, without just outsourcing it. Well, and it's um, part of what brings meaning to your work is to engage with these conversations and to figure out together what, what's possible and what's desired and try to match those things up. And I think it's part of the joy of medicine um, to participate in that. I don't think people want to outsource it. And so part of I, what I see my job is is helping People develop the skills that they need to quickly and efficiently do that work so that they can derive the meaning that their patients can benefit and that it doesn't take up a whole ton of time. So in, in cancer, we often have a, a, a lot of time to over the course of many months or many years to you know, set the stage for these discussions with patients. Uh, in, in trauma, we often see that this is not the case. Yes. Dr. Harbrick, our chief of trauma here, had a question. Yeah, I was just, uh, this is a very interesting exercise. And it, as he dissected through the poem, it kind of illustrated the moral ambiguity, which uh, comes up in the cases that Dr. McMaster mentioned every week. So uh, I was just curious how you take your trainees through dealing with the moral ambiguity that, that varies from case to case and how you provide either guidance or instruction for dealing with those issues on a, on a long-term basis. Yeah, I, it's a great point. And I think it's part of why I turn to narrative medicine and humanities to help create almost a sim lab where you can practice dealing with situations of moral ambiguity that are several steps removed from clinical situations. And one of the things that was re most remarkable to me about this particular time of doing it with the medical residents was how they connected it back to their work in the ICU. I think one of the hardest things to teach um, and almost has to be modeled or practiced in simulations like this is recognizing when a situation is ambiguous and um, being patient that an ambiguous situation usually takes time to unfold. And when it's not clear what to do, sometimes that just means we need to stay where we are. We're in a liminal situation. We're traveling through the dark. We didn't just finish traveling through the dark. And people are so kind of programmed to, we got to get to an answer or we need to resolve this. Um, and I think it's teaching people to be able to be uncomfortable um, in the same way that you're uncomfortable reading a novel when all sorts of stuff is happening and you don't know how it's gonna get resolved. And is the character that you care about gonna end up in a tragic end or not? It, it's a similar process, but I think that um, this idea of slowing down and just recognizing like, um, if you skip through that phase, I think you end up with either guilt or regret when a bad outcome happens. If you slow down, you can recognize that a bad outcome is pretty much independent of a choice that you make in many situations. Um, and I think that allows us to do the work more sustainably. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think slowing down when you feel like speeding up is probably the what I try to teach people when I work in the ICU. And, I think the trauma cases are some of the most hard situations because people go from perfectly healthy to devastatingly injured, life-changing events. And 
they need time, everyone needs time to adjust to a new reality. So I, I appreciate your comments about, uh, you know, reading uh, something that's not surgery uh, and, and perhaps some evidence that it actually has uh, benefits beyond uh, just entertainment. Uh, it's one of the great joys of, you know, after you finish residency and training and, and have some time, realize you can spend a little bit of time reading uh, something that is not related to science and, and surgery. Uh, whether it's just the you know reading a little bit before you go to bed at night or listen, uh, you know, listening to audio books or and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and and literature, I think I, I can't say or don't know at all. It's made me a better person or helped me do my job any better. Maybe it has, but uh, I think it's a great lesson for everybody to to uh, try to enjoy uh, and engage in in this kind of. Uh, slow reading for for, um, for the many benefits that it may have, and maybe it'll even make you a better doctor. Who knows? I think so. I mean, I I hope I can feel make people feel legitimate that this is a part of your training that isn't being provided by your medical school or residency right now, but you can self teach through simply reading good books. I, I asked as an interview question for Sir John Fellows every year. Residents often ask, you know. What's the last book that you read that wasn't surgery? And they think that I'm trying to, you know, see if they're smart and read, you know, something besides surgery. And really, I'm just trying to get suggestions for <laughs> books to read. Every year, I, yep. I get a couple, you know, so. <laughs> Other comments or questions? All right. If not, we're going to take a break and reconvene for resident conference. Oh, I have a present. You get a present, too. Yeah. Wow.